We're about to see a conversation between two people who come from opposite ends of Northern Ireland's political spectrum, but united in their call for justice for victims of the Troubles. Well, this week, a series of revelations are being made in a new book by Maria Cahill. The former SDLP councillor claims to have been sexually abused by her aunt's partner, who was alleged to have been part of the IRA. Now, the book documents the cover-up, intimidation and the continued issues surrounding legacy and reconciliation in Northern Ireland at a time when, today, the Northern Ireland Legacy Bill has just become an act of Parliament. The legislation aims to offer a conditional amnesty to accused killers. Well, our colleague and also former DUP leader, former First Minister Arlene Foster, began by asking Maria to uh, recount her experience at the age of 16. And you may find some of this a little bit disturbing. I think I had two or three tins and I was drinking half of them to try and keep up and putting them down and I became groggy and fell asleep and woke up then to I was being abused yeah. by this individual and I was um, extremely frightened by it. I think it took a few seconds to catch on really what was happening and I, I've tried to explain in the, the book that kind of uh, dilemma that you have in your head that you have to, your brain almost races in a split second uh, few moments because you have to decide very quickly what you're going to do and automatically I decided then that I was going to pretend to be sleeping. Yeah. Um, so that, that was my method, if you like, of just getting through um, each incident and that it became a pattern of behaviour then as, as that went on. The IRA didn't actually come to me until 1999, mm -hmm. so it was October, November, mm -hmm. and they knew that there were children in and out of that house at that time, mm -hmm. but they decided in their own kind of warped morality that they couldn't really approach me before I turned 18. So they waited, and I turned 18 in May, and they came then in October, November. So I just finished doing my A-levels um, when a woman appeared. So you didn't make a complaint to the IRA. The IRA came to you uh, and decided that they were going to investigate, in inverted commas, what had happened. Yeah. Tell our listeners and viewers what, what form that investigation took. They didn't actually tell me initially when yeah. they did come. You know, they, they asked me, or told me rather, to come to a meeting that night. And when I asked what it was about, I, she wouldn't tell me. So this investigation went on, sometimes you were interrogated every day, um, went on for months. And then I think the pinnacle of it all is when you're brought into a room with your abuser, into a small room, and he faces you. The millennium had just happened and we're, yeah. we're into March and they decided that they were going to give me these options, if you like. And thankfully, I wrote them down at the time, you know. Um, so there were a few things that I could withdraw the allegations. Um, they could go and put the allegations, then this is all their terminology, mm -hmm. to them. And one of the, the things which they decided as an option, which they then decided, they took, the, so they chose it, if you like. So they said, oh, we had a number of options that we've been considering, but actually this is what we're going to do, mm -hmm. was what they called a confrontation. And in, again, the IRA's warped kind of world, they decided that sometimes they could read people's body language to see who was telling the truth. Now, that sounds completely ridiculous now, mm -hmm. but in all seriousness at the time, that was, you know, what they were... So bring two people to together and then try yeah. and read how they react to each other. Almost like a court. And the first thing he did was he took his shoe, his trainer off, and he joked with the other individual and said, don't, don't be mine, I hope you're not going to joke about my smelly feet or mm -hmm. some off-the-cuff comment, you know. Uh, Breach sat with a pen and a piece of paper and basically then this confrontation happened between me and him um, where he was basically allowed to tear strips off me. So he was he was shouting, you know, you're wired calling your and, names. Yeah, and, you're a liar and, and what have you, this yeah. didn't happen, whatever. Yeah. So I found that hugely damaging and I still find it hugely damaging. I mean, you have know. sought justice... Um, through a system and, and this book is a real credit to you because you've told the whole story uh, in a very moving way. But if they won't come forward and say that that investigation took place and what happened to you took place, what does it mean for the wider situation in Northern Ireland? And indeed, the fact that Sinn Féin is on course to be in government in the Republic of Ireland. The point when I then did go public um, Jerry Adams wrote a blog where he admitted that the IRA had moved um, and shot and expelled sex offenders, his words. Um, and that was something which I had been saying mm. for quite a long time and, and really 
there had been a lid kept on that. So that exposed that working within the Republican movement. But he used a particular phrase where he in that blog where he said there was no, quote, corporate way of verifying my claims, as he called them. Because the IRA had gone away. Because the IRA had left the stage. Yeah. And I think that that poses a huge problem now for the British government, who have just brought through a legacy bill in relation to Northern Ireland, where they are relying on the cooperation of former paramilitaries um, to provide evidence or information to people who are nursing their hurt quietly at home, who have been bereaved um, or seriously injured as a result of the conflict there. If the IRA have gone... I don't believe they have, but Derry Adams is is arguing that they have. If they have gone and we follow the Republican movement's logic here and there's no corporate way then of verifying anything anybody has been involved in, then no one, no Republican will come forward in any legacy case to provide any meaningful um, information or resolution for anybody. And the British government have gone on a a huge exercise here, which really has protected its own... um, Army veterans, I think, I mean, that that was obviously the reason that the legislation was brought in because they felt it was unfair. Mm -hmm. And I think what they have done quite stupidly, in my view, is put their own army veterans now on a par with the IRA uh, members who were fighting them. So they have put them on an equal playing field. Officialdom has really treated victims shabbily in Northern Ireland for decades, Mm -hmm. you know. uh, But then when you then try to seek some sort of justice resolution or accountability for it, every door is closed to you. And I, I think that that is a really, really unfortunate state of events. Gosh, Mm. wow. In another GB News exclusive interview, a police officer who shot an IRA terrorist in 1991 opened up on how his life has been ruined by years of legal battles. Earlier this month, a man whose identity has been kept secret and is known just as Officer B told us that he hoped the Northern Ireland Legacy Bill would help him get his life back. He's faced six investigations which have all found his actions were justified. It's like an ongoing nightmare for all, isn't it? Let's speak to the... Oh, no, hold on. Let's have a look. Let's listen oh, we've got, to that. we've got yeah. him here. Most of my anger is against the police ombudsman because for seven years and one month until the PPS said there was no case, I've been under this cloud for seven years and one month and it's not pleasant. I live in fear for my life because during that period of time police ombudsman informed me and the police that all my details had been given to the solicitor practice who's representing the family. A dossier of information. They had my picture. They had my name. They had my mobile phone number. They had my dress. They had my company name and where I worked. Mm. As I said, an ongoing nightmare for all, it seems like, doesn't it? Let's speak to the former leader of the DUP and, of course, former First Minister, Arlene Foster. Morning, Arlene. Um, Wow, that was a powerful interview, I must say. Um, But I think to those of us who weren't brought up or living in Northern Ireland during the Troubles, it's very difficult sometimes to understand whether reconciliation and forgiveness can ever be found. What do you think? Well, I think we all hope that reconciliation and forgiveness can be found. Um, But to do that, uh, you have to be truthful and you have to acknowledge what happened in the past. And I think the fundamental issue with this book that Maria Cahill has just brought out is that um, one of those uh, organisations that was engaged in murder and, and sexual abuse and killings refuses to acknowledge what happened in the past. Uh, And indeed, um, the uh, leader of Sinn Féin in Northern Ireland has said there was no alternative to what happened uh, in the past during those awful years uh, of the trouble. So what this book does actually is that it blows the lid of what was happening in a a very Republican area of Northern Ireland. There was essentially um, an alternative justice system uh, running alongside the justice system, which those of us who lived in other parts of Northern Ireland uh, would have gone to. Uh, And it's a a hugely well-written book, very readable. Uh, And I think that Maria has done a great service because not only is she 
coming forward with what happened to her. Uh, and she has an amazing strength, I have to say, guys. Um, but she has also enabled others to come forward as well and say, well, actually, it happened to me as well. Uh, and we didn't feel strong enough to come forward, uh, but we're coming forward now. Uh, and you can understand why some people don't want that line to be drawn. They still want justice to be carried out. And yet you, we, we've got to look to somewhere like South Africa, haven't we, and their Truth and Reconciliation Commission, which was incredibly difficult but did work. And, per and perhaps getting something like that in place may help former members of the IRA to actually speak the truth. <laughs> Well, unfortunately, um, they, there's a couple of things there, Stephen. Um, their own code uh, forbids them for coming forward from uh, and, and giving details of what happened in the past. So their own code prevents that from happening. Uh, and also uh, in the book, it's um, acknowledged that uh, Jerry Adams, uh, the former leader of Sinn Féin, has said that there's no corporate way of verifying uh, because the IRA has moved off the stage, uh, in his words. Uh, so he's basically saying we've no way of uh, saying what happened in the past because they're not there anymore. Uh, uh, there are many, of course, who will say uh, that the IRA Army Council is still in existence, and that includes uh, the Garda Commissioner in the Republic of Ireland and indeed our former Chief Constable as well. So will this new Northern Ireland legacy bill actually achieve anything or will it stand as a barrier to some truths coming forward? Well, I think the difficulty is that uh, one side, if you like, and I hate using that terminology because in some way it gives equivalence and there's no equivalence between members who, who uh, uh, were protecting people in Northern Ireland and those who sought to murder and maim. Um, but the IRA and paramilitaries will not come forward and give that evidence. So the people who are coming forward and giving the evidence uh, to this commission will all be uh, veterans who were here serving in Northern Ireland. And so it's very unbalanced. Uh, and I think that's the difficulty uh, with this new system. Certainly the system that went before uh, was unbalanced uh, and therein lies the difficulty. This was an attempt by the government uh, to try and deal with the inequality that was happening because the Belfast Agreement didn't deal with these uh, victims' issues, and that's 25 years ago, coming on 26 years ago. Uh, and as a result of not dealing with those difficulties at that time, we are still living uh, with the problems of the past in Northern Ireland. Okay.